Dobrodošli, vi gledate Al Jazeera Business Magazine koji ovoga puta specijalno realizujemo sa Webit Festivala u Sofiji. Moje ime je Neira Kozarić. Three years ago when Sofia was referred as the capital of the poorest country in EU. And uh, three years later, after Webit put the name, the branding digital capital, now all global media, including Economist, Forbes, etc., call Sofia and Al Jazeera, call Sofia digital capital. It's quite a nice uh, shift and change of narrative from poorest capital of EU to the digital capital. It's nice. So that's where we are. And I'm grateful that we had the, the chance to do this. We had the impact that we deliver to this part of the world because it's not about Sofia per se, right? It's about the region. I don't think that uh, Bulgaria is um, the most truly amazing, uh, huge thing in the world. I mean, you must be idiot. It's not. Bulgaria is an amazing country, as so are the countries in the region. And we should stop thinking we them we should think us because it's so small that if we think we them we're simply building walls where there should be bridges we're building tension where there should be love and it's stupid on all possible levels so technology is a connector it should not be used as a weapon it should be used as a bridge um, technology could empower people not to leave their homes but to stay and to fulfill their dreams without leaving their families and friends. Because that's how they can achieve their dreams and be successful at the same time being happy. So that's what I believe, that's what Webit's mission is, happiness. Forget about what is technology, why the hell technology? I mean, what is so, so emotional about the steam engine? The same emotional about computers, what, there is nothing about it. There is nothing. It's all about people. If people are not happy, why do we do what we do? Why do we spend the most precious thing we have, our time, on doing things that doesn't improve the quality of our lives? So that's, that's where we are. Focusing Webit in the region, building up value, empowering more people, trying to cut the digital connect to, sh to, to, to basically, hopefully, to, to wipe it out, which is a very tough job. Nothing is short about Webit. Uh, it's huge, it's long, and it's amazing. That's the story of Webit. It uh, started very humbly uh, 11 years ago, and uh, currently we have um, today 15,000 people welcoming from 120 countries. Um, with them, some of the finest global innovators, some of the political leaders, and uh, above all, people with great hearts, people who believe that they can and they have to do something to improve the state of well-being through empowering entrepreneurship through empowering women in business and politics and of course through empowering themselves by connecting with the global leaders by building strong relations because communities are built around people with shared necessities and we have one necessity making this world a better place so Webit currently is um, a global ecosystem of over 800,000 people who receive our newsletters and uh, uh, thousands of people with active engagement and involvement in particular projects. Webit is a platform for discussions. So uh, we do believe that uh, we are in a position and we are empowered by these global leaders to reinvent Europe's future starting at Webit because at the end of the day we need to reinvent it. Europe has lost over one third of its role in the global GDP production over the past 13 years. 13 years ago, Europe was responsible for over 32% of the global GDP production. Currently, it's responsible for less than 21. 
We have lost one third of our role in the global value uh, production. And what? Where are we going? What else should happen in order to make the leap? Because we have, it, it must be a jump. It's not a step anymore. It must be a gigantic uh, jump in order to, to continue providing this amazing, wonderful quality of living that Europe and Europeans have, which basically is the foundations of happiness. So um, we are very fortunate to have the trust, I mean trust, of all these global leaders coming to, to Webet, openly speaking and being available for discussions. At the end of the day, it's again about the hearts. Whether Europe is ready to jump? No, it's not. Is uh, uh, South America ready to jump? No, it's not. Is Africa ready to jump? No, it's not. Is the humankind ready to jump? No, it's not. It's not about readiness or not. It's just the science fiction is, is slower than the reality. That's the fact. Nobody's ready to jump, but we have to do it. Otherwise, we jeopardize our own future. Now, more or less, the whole humankind is, is becoming entrepreneurs because entrepreneurship starts at the corner, at the edge of the zone of comfort. We are way beyond the zone of comfort, all of us. We have to realize it, get together, and do what we have to do. Tokom Webit festivala održano je više od stotinu panela na nekoliko lokacija. U fokusu su bili umjetna inteligencija i proširena stvarnost. Primjeni umjetne inteligencije u zdravstvu posvećen je cijeli dan festivala. Istražili smo koje će inovacije nova tehnologija unijeti u liječenje pacijenata, izvođenje operativnih zahvata i koliko će unaprijediti cijelokupan sektor. What I'm trying to do is put some reality around artificial intelligence because there's a lot of terms. Um, there's a lot of uh, misnomers in some cases. People don't really truly understand the value of artificial intelligence. So you need to look at it as an ability to look at data and make actionable insights. And actionable is the key because we can get insights from information. That's not a problem. We can understand information, look at data, but it's the actionable insights is where AI starts to really give benefit. So, so think of it as a system that is learning from the information you have. And, then, and make reality out there. So, so today was a great example where I was trying to say to people, look, artificial intelligence isn't this scary beast because artificial is a scary word. <clears throat> you have to think of it as augmentation of information. So it's adding more information to what you already know and making a more informed decision is really what it is. Again, very early stages, <clears throat> excuse me, of AI, there was a lot of, um, you know, human against machine, right? Uh, the robotics world. So, so that's out there. I mean, the, the science fiction world is out there and will AI become science fiction? Maybe. But right now, I think that people are trying to adopt it more because they're using it already. Um, I used an example of my, my eight-year-old son that uses AI on his Xbox, on FIFA, right? He doesn't even know he's got it now, but he doesn't know what it means. So I try to explain to him, it's learning what you're doing and it's getting better. So why isn't that, why isn't that beneficial? So I think combining humans and data, it happens now. I mean, we do it every single day. So I think that, you know, we, we have data. Um, in, in some cases, especially in Europe, we, we're still on paper. So you can't go from paper to AI. You just cannot. So first of all, you have to digitize your information. You have to provide it in a, in a format that can be read. And, and, and then you can do AI. So I think it, it impacts healthcare in environments where they're mature in their data and they understand the data. I think when you go to an organization that is still trying to consolidate, then right now that's not the right place to go with AI. So I think that um, you know, the, the question is around you know, um, what, what is the impact in healthcare? The impact in healthcare is there is apps out there. People are using AI. They are looking at information based on a system that is reasoning in and accessing data. So the thread earlier was de democratization of data, of health. That's access to information. And, and artificial intelligence is not biased. It can look at information. It can give more insights. Um, and you'd argue with anybody, would you not want more information? In different areas. So again, you've got to look at the maturity of a market. So if we go to the US, mature with regards to adoption of AI, we come over to Europe, want to know about it. So they're kind of in a discovery phase. So the question was around specifically who are data donors and who are not data donors. So, so which people would be comfortable? And 
the, the only way to do it is you have to provide, I think everyone would come on board if you tell them what you're going to do with it. I think the, the, not just healthcare, but industries as a whole has been poisoned by you know, press releases and, and bad stories around data. And I think that you, if you tell someone, for example, I was trying to say in earlier, you know, everyone under 30 years of age, we want to map your cardiac genome profile because we want to benefit pediatrics, they will do it. Because there's an insight and it's actionable and it's controlled. So I don't think people are scared of sharing the data, they're scared of what you're gonna do with it. So it's about defining what we're gonna do with the information. Order is a great example, back to your question around adopting AI technology, what are people doing? So we worked with them a number of years ago and they came to us and said, look, we want to reduce the anxiety levels of children pre and post surgical. So monitoring that anxiety, what we did is we built an avatar, an app. The child can create the avatar. They can talk to it and it answers them back. It, 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 it also measures their tone and sentiment to certain questions so that the clinicians know preoperatively what they worried about. They also take it home and postoperatively it can continue to care for them. So you taking a, a, a level, an anxiety, it's not, it's not you know, it, it's a massive personal issue, but they've seen huge reduction in anxiety levels with children because they're so informed and, and we forget, you know, the children are our future, right? We forget they need to be as informed as we do. So healthcare as we know it needs to evolve and change. We can't afford healthcare, it's too expensive. And actually it's not affordable, it's not accessible, it's not equitable. So technology for me is going to be the cornerstone of trying to figure out how to make healthcare better for everybody. So the idea of a hospital of the future is bringing technology like AI, like virtual reality, like big data, nanobiotechnology, wearable sensors, and to really make sure that we future-proof, bring it together, to ensure those technologies will impact healthcare better than before. So I think technology will interface and transform healthcare in a way that we haven't seen before, making it more affordable, more accessible, more equitable. So I think surgery is ripe for disruption. We need to improve standards, improve outcomes, and overall improve the care. So virtual reality will allow us to train people differently, almost immersed in a different world, if you like. So imagine the future where you could do a, a virtual reality operation almost like real, before you ever enter the operating theatre. That will improve the safety for the patients in the operating theatre and improve the standards of care. AI will allow us to interrogate the data, make it more precise, allow us to assess people's quality in a way that hasn't been done before. And the data will be empowering that clinician to make better decisions in the future. I was very curious about how we could improve education uh, for surgeons and train people better. We've been historically trained the same way with crowd operating rooms, trying to show people what's going on, and they can't see a thing. So actually, when Google Glass came out back in 2014, I thought we could use a simple device, literally a smartphone on your head, connect people using smart technology, push out a feed of a video through my eyes to the rest of the world. And people, students, trainees, could literally watch the operation through my eyes on their smartphone. They could ask questions on their smartphone, like a text message, which would come up on the glass in the corner, so I could see it, interact with them, and teach people on a global scale. And on that day, I taught 14,000 people across the globe in 118 countries. Um, luckily, I've got a team of people who really want to transform and change healthcare. And we're fortunate in South America, in Bolivia, where we've got so much support that we make sure that we care with regulation, that we take care with standards, so we don't disrupt in a way that's damaging or unsafe. Ultimately, it has to be a safe, effective hospital with good governance, but then supported and improved by access to technology. And that's the way I like to see it as, a kind of a, a movement in the right direction, but ultimately it's going to be safe and effective. Otkrivanje budućnosti slogan je Webit festivala. Predstavljene inovacije su ogledalo onoga što nas može očekivati u dalekoj budućnosti. Najveći izazov sa kojima se susreću inovatori je pravni okvir, jer su njihovi proizvodi potpuna novina za regulatore.
Oh, well, the new innovations that you have seen, of course, revolve around products for our customers. Uh, for example, the Echo family of devices powered by Alexa. That's a cool innovation. One that we're still working on is Amazon Prime Air. This is package delivery by drone. So lots of, lots of cool innovations. So package delivery by drone really isn't the focus. The focus is getting packages to customers within 30 minutes of an order. So that's the goal. We think we can do this by unmanned aerial vehicle or drone. Uh, and we've been working on this for several years now. There are a lot of technical challenges, there are legal and regulatory challenges, but we're addressing them all. We simply won't launch the service until we've demonstrated safety, and that's what regulators will require as well. So we're going to bring it to customers as soon as we've been able to demonstrate its safety and get regulatory approvals. Well, there's, oh, it's still day one in e-commerce. You got to remember that e-commerce remains well under 10% of retail. So over 90% of what people buy, they're buying offline. And so there's a tremendous amount of headroom for growth by companies like Amazon, but also for other companies as well. And so Amazon has lots of big plans, but it's still day one in serving our customers. We want to be highly innovative on behalf of our customers. Innovation requires experimentation, trying things new that have never been done before. And if you experiment and it's never been done before, you really can't know how it's going to turn out. Failure must be a possibility whenever you're innovating or experimenting. And so we welcome failure in the context of experimentation and innovation. Most of the failures, including billions of dollars worth of failures, have not occurred publicly. They've not gone out to customers. One failure that did make it out to customers was the Fire Phone. And this was a really cool, innovative device. It was a telephone, but it didn't work out, at least commercially. But the good news is many of the innovations in that phone wound up in some of the commercial products that our customers have liked, like the Echo family of digital assistants. Flying drones, uh, flying bikes, uh, robots, uh, humanoid robots, robots companions, etc. It's um, we call it this year uh, at Webit. We call it preview the future, and and preview the future is very important because you still have chance to change it in order to build a desirable future. Right. That's why we want to preview it. It gives you the opportunity to have a glance and understand if you like it or you don't like it. When I was little, I dreamt that I could sleep in an extra five minutes before going to school if I could fly instead of driving. And from there, I taught myself aeronautical engineering on the side in university. And uh, the math said it's possible. And so after working for a number of years, I said, well, why not go and actually try to make it happen? This one is a, uh, this prototype is about two years old. We considered our proof of concept technology demonstrator. Um, and we're preparing our next generation vehicle, which looks much, much nicer than this. It has many, many improvements. Uh, that should be getting finished up in about three or four months and will be revealed this fall for the first time. I really think that in the beginning it starts out as a recreational toy. While you work out the kinks, you make sure that you can prove that everything is safe and you learn how do you make these work as well as you possibly can. Once the regulatory side of things are in place, you go from recreation into actual transportation. You hop in one of these, you push a button and it flies you to work fully autonomously with no input from you. Short answer is uh, this technology has taken the world by storm and it's so new that most countries have no regulations about any of this because this didn't exist even a few years ago. Um, so the regulatory side is, a, is an issue for us just because it takes governments a few years to figure out new regulations and how to do this safely and it's just difficult to wait when we see the technology is there and ready to go. It is difficult to be, feel like you're being held back by that. Oh, it's incredible. It feels, the best sensation I can liken it to is it feels like you're floating in midair and wherever you tell it to, if you tell it to go forward, back, left, right, it feels just like you're floating in that direction. There's no sense of movement. You're just gliding like you're on a magic carpet. We are the company that built the first ever hover bike. And now we're transforming the logistics industry by making the last mile supply chain completely unmanned and aerial. The concept, the concept is safety. So there are many uses for helicopters, but for some of them, it's either expensive or dangerous. 
And if you can not risk the life of a person and also make the operation cheaper, then this is when it comes to the sin. So it was initially designed for uh, uh, basically as a helicopter close to the ground. So, so the rotors are not exposed and it's less likely to have an accident. But then we turn that into a logistics platform. So it is fully unmanned, doesn't require a pilot. You just need to tap into a screen and send up to 130 kilograms of supplies anywhere within uh, the, the last mile area, which is not one mile, it's from one to 20, one to 30. That, that's where the, the real value of that is, especially places where there's no infrastructure at all in, in many scenarios. We're mostly working with humanitarian organizations and defense organizations. So for them, it's really critical because they don't have infrastructure where they have to act. And they're really risking life by just sending trucks or helicopters to dangerous places and maybe they cannot land. So we're testing those with, with this, this sort of uh, clients that we almost call like partners. So we work so closely together trying to you know, develop something that's actually useful and can, can change the world in a better way. Well, legal issues are mostly liability. So that's why autonomous cars are not there yet. If, you have, if there's an accident, who's liable for it? Was it the car, which was just a computer? Was it the engineers that programmed that computer? Or was it someone else that ha caused the accident? So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is safety. You need to demonstrate that it's safe to operate around. Webit commits, uh, is responsible for over 60 million euro um, of uh, economic impact to the, to the whole city. That was the reason that 27 cities in Europe um, participated in our open call for a uh, uh, whole city of uh, Webit Festival 2020. 27 cities, including London, Paris, Vienna, Tel Aviv, uh, Madrid, Valencia, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, uh, Brussels, Budapest, you name it. So 20, even the Olympic Games in Europe, it had not had that many cities applying for hosts. We are very humbled and honored by such interest from all these amazing cities. We had to choose one though, and uh, our choice was based on the city with the highest ambition, with the biggest commitment to make a difference in growing their entrepreneurial ecosystem and building with Webit Foundation a real tower. A tower that high that could be seen from all around the world. That was our initial brief for all participants. And that tower is built on a very stable basis. It comes with trust, it comes with respect, and it comes with ambition. So we have found these three in a perfect synchronicity, synchronicity. Of course, all the candidates were amazing. I mean, I, I told you the names. You can't expect London or all these. I mean, you can't expect anything but great. At the end of the day, we decided that the mission of, of, of Webet could be matched perfectly by not a first year city, not a capital. We go where it's more difficult. We always go where it's more difficult. The easy we leave to somebody else. We decided to choose the city with the ambition to become number one without being number one, and this is the city of Valencia. So my congratulations to Valencia for being selected. Yesterday we announced the city where Webit Festival Europe 2020 will take place. To bi bilo sve što smo vam pripremili u ovo sedmičnom izdanju Al Jazeera Business magazina. Lijepi pozdrav iz Sofije.